All right, I know that ever since Axel Alonso stepped down as editor-in-chief at Marvel Comics and C.B. Cebulski was picked to replace him, you guys have been wanting me to talk about, but honestly, I have nothing to say on the subject. There just isn't enough to say about C.B. Cebulski. He's a total question mark in the industry. Sure, I've heard his name mentioned a few times, but nobody can really point to him and attribute anything to him. If only they had picked someone else to take that spot, someone who I actually could talk about. Like, I don't know, just picking a name at random. Akira Yoshida, he was this writer that worked at Marvel a couple of years ago. Did a lot of eh, interesting stuff, I guess you could say. But you know, that guy, he sticks in the mind. I would have remembered him if only they had picked that guy for... This news story is so depressing, I can't even finish that opening joke. Yes, guys, I'm sorry. I know that what's going on in the comic book industry this week is kind of a big deal, and it needs to be talked about how insanely huge and stupid this was of C.B. Sapolsky to do this, but guys, I'm begging you here. If I talk about the problems going on at Marvel one more freaking time, I'm going to give myself an ulcer, so we're not doing that. We're not. No, today, I'm going to talk about something fun and lighthearted and uplifting and you know what I find to be fun, lighthearted, and uplifting? Indie comics. So today we're doing another indie spotlight and I'm going to focus on two of the most upbeat, wacky, and crazy books that you can find at your local comic book store right now. Now the first book I'm going to talk about today comes from Aftershock Comics and there are a lot of indie companies out there but Aftershock Comics has really put their foot down and said no, we're going to be the next big deal. We've got all these amazing titles out there, we're going to make a huge splash on the scene and a lot of their books have taken off. But honestly, there are a ton of amazing books coming out from Aftershock Comics that nobody's really talking about, and that's why I have to talk today about Fujitsu. This to me is one of the craziest, most fun books I have read in years. In a way, it captures everything that I love from the wacky side of comic books, and I haven't really heard that many people talking about. The critics are loving it. It's getting amazing reviews across the board, but I still have not seen a lot of people online saying anything about, so consider me a person online who is now saying something about. Fujitsu is the story of a 120 year old man who is the world's greatest martial artist, but also the world's smartest scientist, but because of his amazing training, still looks like a 15 year old boy. And if you think that sounded nuts, that is the least crazy thing in this entire book. Yes, Fujitsu really has a feeling to it, like it is supposed to be a tribute to the golden age of comics, and I don't just mean like golden age superheroes, I also mean like the pulp stuff, I also mean the crazy wacky sci-fi science adventure comics. It really seems to capture that sense of weird off the wall concepts that those books specialized in, but at the same time it updates it and really sets it in a modern day setting, and I think that's one of the things that makes it feel so incredibly unique. Now this series begins off with Fujitsu telling us his origin story as he is in a sensory deprivation tank that he has been in for three years now, two miles under Antarctica. I told you this was gonna get nuts. Now he comes out of the sensory deprivation tank and the first thing he wants is a Whataburger and then he breaks down the science of why a Whataburger is so incredibly amazing and then when he is asked why did you go into a sensory deprivation tank for three years two miles under Antarctica he just pauses mid bite in his burger and then just goes it was because of a girl and I was like that's what makes this guy so amazing. We know he's 120 years old, we know he's the world's greatest scientist and an amazing martial artist, but he still, he still kind of comes off as a flawed character. He still kind of comes off as, yeah, but I'm still a human. I mean, what do you want from me, people? And it's not just any woman that he tried to forget about in this sensory deprivation tank. It's his ex-girlfriend, who is a robot that he built, starting off building her just to be a lamp. But then he kept tinkering with her until she became a fully functioning AI machine that had her own mind and then they hooked up and then she was like, yeah, I don't, yeah, it's not going to work out and then he just got really sad about it. We've all been there. We've all been dumped by 
robots that we created. Uh, I don't know what that could even mean. Someone's going to interpret that to be some weird. It's just a crazy joke I made up, people. Um, but yes, so after that, his arch nemesis, who is like a 10 foot tall, almost dressed like an old prospector, just with a big bushy beard and long ass suspenders, this huge giant tall man, he has uncovered what is known as the Atomic Katana, which was a katana that was created in the burst of a nuclear bomb by reanimated zombie Nazi occultist. I told you this was gonna get weird, and it ain't slowing down, folks. So he gets this katana, and it gives him unlimited power, and within the span of one issue, he takes over the entire world, and then tells the entire world to start hunting down Fujitsu. Amazing concept for this. In one issue, we get to a point that any other character would take an entire year to get to, but it doesn't feel rushed. This book is so crazy that it can throw anything it wants at you and you're just like, yeah, okay, I buy it. That's what this story is. All right, I'm fully on board for this now. And it keeps getting crazier because at the end of issue number one, this villain named Robert Woodlow sends his top assassin to go and kill Fujitsu. His top assassin, James Dean. And I don't mean like a time traveling James Dean. No, it's a, I faked my death to become a killer assassin James Dean. Why James Dean? Cause it's fun, I guess. It's crazy, it's nuts. I didn't see it coming, you didn't see it coming. Did you say you saw it coming? You're lying, stop lying to this comic book. So, James Dean goes to try and kill Fujitsu and Fujitsu kills him by turning a toaster into an invisible barrier projection machine that blocks him from all the attacks. Then he duct tapes a flashlight onto this thing tampers with all the little switches in there and turns it into a death ray to take out James Dean. With a flashlight, a toaster, and some duct tape. I have to remind you guys, that's what he did. This is like MacGyver on the next, next, next level. And it works because this is a book that turns to you and within the first like two, three pages lets you know exactly what you're in for. And after that point, if you start questioning any of the logic in here, then you're kind of the one who's wrong on this. This is a book that is able to do anything it wants with these characters and with this world. And it's able to set up the rules of this world so incredibly well that you buy it. Nothing they can do in here will make you go, well, that doesn't make sense or that doesn't track with the rest of this book. But at the same time, it also doesn't feel like it's being written by a child who is just like screaming out their weird ideas and you're just putting it to paper. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Axe Cop was a wonderful book and we all loved it, okay? But this feels like it's written by someone who has a plan for how all this works. It doesn't feel random. It feels like, no, in this guy's mind, he's got the formula for how this world works. None of this just feels like random things happening. It feels like, yeah, with what I know about Fujitsu, you want to show me that he's a guy who can turn a toaster and a flashlight into a death ray? I believe it. It matches what I have seen so far. And the characters are so incredibly memorable and so incredibly likable. And the dialogue is so witty. That's the thing that also helps all the craziness in this book work. It's that you really get attached to the characters. Like for example, Fujitsu himself. I already mentioned that we saw early on, okay, he's the brightest and the strongest and the greatest person that ever lived but he's still very human. He still has a weak spot in him. He still has some insecurities to him. And that really plays out throughout this book because in order to save the world, the only person who is on his side is his ex-robot girlfriend, who they have to now pair up. And Fujitsu, yeah, he is incredibly capable. He knows what he's doing, but he's now around this person who is like, okay, okay well, I... I want to do this by myself, but you're here now, and oh, well, I guess I have to deal with that now. It's like, yeah, you kind of feel for the guy, because like, oh, she broke your heart, man. Oh, poor guy, but you're still, you're still being a professional, still realizes that you need to uh, team up with her to save the world. It's like, okay, I can, I can understand this guy. All right. Uh, and she's a great character, too, because while she was created originally to be a lamp, she's still like, no, I'm and thinking individual character here. I'm not like some pawn for you to use, but at the same time, I want us to be friends. I want us to move along. I want us to be able to work together. And it's like, you kind of root for her too. It's like, yeah, man, come on. Let's 
Can't you just get over this by now? You spent three years in a sensory deprivation tank trying to get over this. How much more baggage do you possibly have about this? But as good as these characters are, it's the way that they interact that is the star of this whole series. These characters are great on their own, but when you actually see them exchanging dialogue with one another, everything goes up to the next level. And the reason why I say that is because even though she's a robot and he is a 120 year old human, he is so much more robotic than she is and she is so much more human than, she, than he is. And it's that relationship that makes them so interesting. There is one line of dialogue in here that sums up everything that I love about these two characters but also everything that I love about the whole series in general. There was a moment in which Fujitsu quotes Arthur C. Clarke, and she says, oh yeah, you're quoting Arthur C. Clarke, and he goes, the C stood for copycat. Anytime that we went on an adventure together, he just turned it into a book. And she goes, were you? Were you inspiration for Dave the Astronaut? And then he goes, what? No, I was inspiration for Hal. I went, that sums up everything about this book and this character that makes Fujitsu so great. He is a human who went on adventures with Arthur C. Clarke. Arthur C. Clarke ripped off all their adventures and yet turned him into Hal and Fujitsu is mad he doesn't get credit for being Hal. Like it almost sounds like he is envious that people don't know, yeah, I was the crazy killer robot. Doesn't anybody see that? Like there's something, again, He's so robotic and so logical and so wise and mystical and with the fact that he's 120 years old and yet he's still human enough that he's ticked that he doesn't get credit for being the killer robot from 2001 A Space Odyssey. So yes, that's Fujitsu from Aftershock Comics. The first two issues are already out and issue three just came out today. So go into your local comic book store, check it out. And if they don't have it, Aftershock Comics is really good about getting their trades out pretty darn quick. So you can always wait for that trade or I'll put a link in the description down below of where you can buy it digitally on Comixology. I don't know why I decided to go all sing something with Comixology, but it happened. The next indie book that I'm going to talk about is called Interceptor. Now, some of you might be thinking, Interceptor, you already talked about this one, and you said that these were fairly new books, and this one came out over a year ago. Hold on, I'm getting to that. Interceptor was a series from Donny Cates. Now, Donny Cates I have mentioned several times on this show because right now he is my MVP in the indie scene and he just moved over to Marvel and he's doing Doctor Strange and Thanos and I love the first issue of both of those books they did over there so I have high hopes for everything he's going to do at Marvel but he is still doing amazing stuff in the indie scene and something that he did for Heavy Metal Comics a few years back was called Interceptor and it was a book about a future where mankind flew off into space and all mankind is ruled by an immortal 10 year old president. Wow, there is really an odd theme in the books I'm talking about today. But anyway, they are ruled by an immortal 10 year old president who is the most corrupt politician you will ever meet. And they say that they moved to space because Earth became littered with nuclear fallout after a nuclear war. However, vampires have come to their wonderful, pristine city in space. And at that point, the president reveals to his special agent, yeah, here's the deal. We didn't actually escape because of nuclear war. We caused nuclear war to kill all the vampires on Earth. Turns out, after a couple millennia, the vampires survived and they have now learned how to build their own rocket ships and they're going to come to our planet so we have to now send you back to the desolate wasteland that is Earth to just take out all the vampires before they can do that. So they suit up this special agent in a holy mech suit and shoot her all the way across space to the ravished wasteland that is Earth and she just starts taking out all these vampires only to discover that they lied to her. They didn't pick up everyone and take them to space. They only picked up all the people that they wanted to take into space. All the pretty rich people. Everyone else was left to fend for themselves on the nuclear fallout covered earth that was now being littered with cockroach-like vampires. Oh my god, this is the most heavy metal concept I have ever seen for a book. Seriously, heavy metal should just have replaced their logo on all their comics with a picture of the main character from Interceptor. 
So after our protagonist lands on Earth and discovers that there are still other humans on this planet and they have spent generations fighting against these irradiated super powered vampires, she decides, wait, so they just lied to us and to make us feel better about abandoning Earth? That you guys are still stuck here and you guys have been fighting and dying because they didn't want to take you? That's wrong. And I'm gonna go in there and kick all these vampires' asses. And indeed she does. It is nothing but just page after page of this character in her holy mech suit just kicking all kinds of vampire ass. It's some of the coolest action sequences I have seen in the past couple of years in a comic. And it all leads up to a big climax and I won't reveal what happens. However, at the end of it, it's really kind of hinted, okay, now what happens? Because at the end of the book, they don't take out the big boss vampire. And they hint that the big boss vampire is even worse than the ones they were fighting in this one. And they were fighting some tough monsters in this one. So, are they going to be able to take out the big boss vampire? And what about all the evil, corrupt humans still living in space? What happens when they learn that their special agent isn't coming back to them? And she's going to keep fighting on Earth? Well, they don't like that. They don't like the idea that, hey, maybe someone could reveal that we kind of screwed the pooch in the past and that there's actually vampires coming to get us and uh, we kind of just told all these other humans to piss off. And uh, yeah, that doesn't really look good for us. Let's just destroy the entire planet Earth. So that was kind of the cliffhanger we got left with. And I had been sitting there going, man, I want this to come back, but it didn't sell all that much. In fact, nothing at Heavy Metal Comics was really selling all that much, which is a shame because it's Heavy Metal Comics. They're an, iconic co they're an iconic company. You feel like they should be able to carry some more weight, but yeah, it didn't really do the numbers that people wanted, even though it got amazing reviews and anyone who read it loved that book and had been waiting on it to return. And Heavy Metal has been putting out fewer and fewer comics over the past couple years and I was like, even if Donny Cates is now a big name, it ain't happening. I just had to give up on it. And today, when I went into my store, I started setting up the wall for all the books that are coming out next week. One of my coworkers came up to me and said, did you know that the second part of Interceptor is out? And I was like, what are you talking about? There aren't any heavy metal books coming out this week. And he goes, yeah, they picked it up and left heavy metal. It's now gone over to Vault Comics, which by the way, just like Aftershock, Vault is another really darn good indie company that not a lot of people are talking about. Vault specializes in sci-fi series. This is an amazing book to take over to Vault Comics, but they changed its name to Reactor. That's why I didn't know it was coming back. It changed its name. And today, issue number one of Reactor just came out. And if you can't find Interceptor, because Heavy Metal refuses to put it out in trade, hopefully it's on Comixology. If it is, I'll put it in a link down below uh, because it really is worth checking out. But if you did not check out Interceptor, the first issue of this actually starts with a big, here's everything that happened, but they summarize it very quickly, very concise. You can understand everything that you missed out on very quickly. And then it goes right into the action again, which again was the star of this entire series. Oh my God, they, they didn't miss anything. It's just as good as Interceptor was. I'm loving it. Except that now our protagonist from the last one, she is not in the mech suit. She gave it to this little girl who she met in the last series who, listen, typically I hate that stereotype of the foul mouthed little girl who teams up with the big badass. I, I don't know why, but that's one of those tropes that just bugs me. Maybe because it's overused, maybe because we see a lot. I love it in this one. The little foul mouthed girl in this series is great. And when you give her a mech, she's even more of an a-hole to these vampires. But they're vampires. Someone should be an a-hole to them. And she just charges in in this mech. And it's one of the most fun sequences I've read all year in a comic in which she is just blasting away at these zombies. There is something about seeing a like 12 year old girl in a giant mech suit just tell all these vampires to suck her robot d that made me go, I don't know why I'm laughing at this, but I'm laughing to the point that tears are almost coming out of my eyes. I'm a simple man. I know what I enjoy in comics. Apparently this is it. In fact, when she storms this vampire stronghold, the opening joke of that 
was so damn good. Normally, I don't spoil jokes, but I just have to bring it up real quick because I have to ask a question at the end of this in the off chance that maybe Donny Cage is listening to this. It opens up with these two vampires talking about Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope, and one of them is saying, why would they call it Episode Four when it's the first one? And the other one goes, well, they did eventually go back and make the first three, and goes, oh yeah, were they any good? And the other vampire goes, yeah, they were really good. In fact, there's this really funny alien rabbit in there who just made me crack up so much. And then right when he's in the middle of complimenting Jar Jar Binks, this girl flies right through them and blasts them to hell. And she just goes, ding dong. I wanna know, is that a reference to Loco Steve from Rage Select? Is that a reference to the Loco Steve character on the Let's Play channel Rage Select. I know the odds of that are minuscule and microscopic and almost nothing, but it's all that I could think of in my mind. If I ever meet Donny Cates at a convention, that is the only question I'm going to ask him. But yeah, this book, it's just as fun as Interceptor was. I loved Interceptor. It was a huge surprise for me to see that it was coming back and it was coming into stores today. When you work in a comic book store and you have a comic book YouTube channel, you spend so much of your time having to study up on everything that's coming out. And there's so few things that actually surprise you anymore. This was my Christmas, walking in there and seeing that Reactor was out and Reactor was the follow-up to Interceptor. I was so happy about it, and I had a blast reading this issue. Guys, go and check these series out, Reactor and Fujitsu, and of course, Interceptor, the first series in the Reactor. I'm hoping it's a trilogy. I wanna see a third part to this. But yes, check all those out. Links to them in Comixology are going to be down below. Thank you guys for tuning in. Let me know if there are any indie books that you wanna see in next month's Indie Spotlight. And if you wanna see any of our other comic book videos, we do them every single Wednesday on this channel. And on the weekends, we do other fun, geeky videos such as movie reviews or game reviews. So if you wanna see any of that, then make sure you hit the subscribe button. And as always, share these videos around the web. It's the best way to help our channel grow. And you can always follow me on Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr at Professor Thorgy. And I don't think I have anything else to add to this. <sighs> Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Come back next time. Bye.